Hello, in this video I'm going to review this brand new lens from Canon for the RF mount, which is the RF 16mm f2.8 STM lens. And Canon claims that this lens is perfect for landscape photography, vlogging and also astrophotography. Yeah, they said it themselves on their product launch. So let's put that to the test, shall we? And before we begin, I just wanted to say that I wasn't paid by Canon or anything like this. This is a totally independent review. I paid for this lens for my own money and everything I say is absolutely honest. So yeah, let's get started. So the lens itself is very very tiny, small and lightweight. This almost looks like a nifty 50 for the RF mount. I think that they may even reuse the same housing for this lens. So on the front you have only one ring and this ring is multi-purpose which means that you can control your focus with this ring but also you can control the like additional features like, uh, like on a control ring on other RF mount lenses. And this is kind of a pain for some people because there is no switch on the lens to switch between manual and autofocus. So if you want to focus manually you need to switch to focus control on the lens and then you need to go to the camera menu and switch the focusing mode from AF to MF. You need to go to the menu which is kind of a bummer for some people honestly I don't mind and if this allowed Canon to have a more compact and uh, smaller uh, footprint on this lens and cut down production costs then I'm all for it. The back element of this lens protrudes a little bit uh, into the camera but no worries if you want to use clip-in filters for astrophotography both the Optolong L Pro filter and filters clip-in filters from Astronomic are compatible to be used with this RF16. I tested it myself and it works no problems. And also last thing there is no weather sealing on this lens which is not surprising given the price of this lens. There is also an optional lens hood that you can attach to this lens if you want to but you would need to purchase it separately. All right so first let's talk about the use of this lens for landscape, cityscape, that kind of photography because this is what you usually would use an ultra wide 16 millimeter lens for and also maybe architecture but for that I wouldn't really recommend this lens for a reason that I will get into in just a second. So at the time of recording this video there is actually no official lens profile in Adobe Lightroom that you can use to correct for any kind of distortion. So I'm going to show you the raw images that I have taken with my Canon EOS R and also the JPEGs that the camera produced which are corrected so you can see the difference and also of course in the future there will be some update to Lightroom with the lens profile so you can correct your RAWs uh, in post-production if you want to. So let's take a look at some images. All right, so here are some images that I have taken just by having a walk with my dog. And let's take a look at maybe uh, this vertical one. And this is a RAW image and this is a JPEG produced by the camera. So let's compare them. And as you can see, this is the JPEG on the right. This is the RAW on the left. The, they have been shot using the f2.8 uh, maximum aperture. And the colors are a little bit different because of the color profile, but don't worry about that. What is important is that, as you can see, the framing is a little bit different. The JPEG is a little bit more punched in than the RAW. And that is because they uh, actually this lens suffers from a crazy barrel distortion. So if you would like to correct this, as you can see also there is a lot of vignetting here. But if you want to correct for the barrel distortion, you can uh, actually, without the official lens profile yet, you can go to the develop module. And then somewhere down below you have this uh, manual control over lens correction. So normally you would see that. As you can see this is turned on but it does nothing because there is no lens profile for this lens. You can go to manual and then you can correct for the distortion manually. And then if you go to constraint crop you can sort of get to a similar framing that they have with the JPEG. And if we go to compare right now this is pretty much the framing. As you can see, this is punched in even a little bit more. And in order to, to get this, I had to use some crazy, uh, crazy levels of distortion removal. You can see that those edges had to be stretched really, really hard in order to correct for that. And this is even more apparent if we take a look, for instance, on some image with trees. Uh, let's take a look at this one, for instance. and. Uh, as you can see, there is a lot of barrel dist Well, it's not apparent right now because I've actually corrected for it. Let's go to reset. And as you can see, those trees on the sides, uh, 
Those trees on the sides, uh, they're not straight, they are bent because of the barrel distortion. And in order to correct for that, again, I would have to um, go here and correct for it manually. I think around 80 is something that I would use. And the upside of doing that is that you are actually getting rid of the extreme corners with a lot of vignetting. But again, those edges are getting stretched out, which which kind of, uh, you know, the image quality suffers in those corners for sure. And by the way, um, most of these images that I'm going to show you in this video, you will be able to download them for yourself to play around in Lightroom. Check them out, pixel peep, whatever you want. I will put links down below in the description for absolutely free, no questions asked. So you can, you can expect those images. So, like I mentioned, I wouldn't recommend this lens for arch architecture photography because, especially with interiors, the barrel distortion would be very much apparent. And if you want to correct for that using this, this pincushion stretching, the image quality in the corners would suffer. So, for that kind of use, I wouldn't recommend that. However, for landscape photos, as you can see, the images are very, very decent and the barrel distortion for in most cases is not even that apparent. So maybe you don't even need to bother doing that. Um, let's take a look at some sharpness tests. So I have a couple of images here um, that are just, you know, shot straight up into the sky. As you can see, this is F4 and this is F28. So let's compare them and let's see how they stack up against each other. When it comes to sharpness in the center, the sharpness even at f2.8 is pretty much exactly the same as sharpness at f4. So I would say that the sharpness of this lens wide open is very impressive. Uh, of course, if you go to the edges, the, the sharpness is, is getting, uh, getting worse and worse. And as you can see, the vignetting at f2.8 is definitely stronger than vignetting at f4, which is definitely something to, to expect. And then if we switch between f4 and f5.6, so let's compare f4 to f5.6. Again, the, the framing is not the same, but kind of similar. And as you can see, again, the sharpness is, is pretty much the same. So I would say that when it comes to the sharpness, this lens is perfectly usable straight from the maximum f2.8 aperture. And this lens actually uh, is able to focus, uh, uh, to close focus very, very close to your subject. And the sharpness, the close focus sharp sharpness, also straight from f2.8 is very impressive in my opinion. Let me show you some examples. So I have uh, this shot, for instance, this was shot at f2.8. This is the entire frame. As you can see, I got so close to these to this fruits on, on a tree that the entire background is completely out of focus. So f2.8, uh, gives you is enough to 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 give you those those creative options for for close-up photography and if we inspect it as you can see the focus is on this on this berry right here or whatever it is and i think the sharpness is very impressive again you can download this image and take a look at it yourself and then i have another example here which was shot at f4 uh, and again the focus was on this this part of a tree somewhere here and i would say that the sharpness of this lens is very much impressive now, when it comes to astrophotography and uh, the 16 millimeters focal length on a full frame camera, honestly, for me, it's a little bit too wide, especially for like standalone pictures of the Milky Way or constellations. But if you like to have your framing that wide, then you can definitely use that for that. I think the best use for a 16 mil for astrophotography is star trails or maybe time lapses, that kind of stuff. So would I recommend this lens for astrophotography? Well, let's take a look. So the maximum aperture of f2.8 for astrophotography, typically I would recommend getting a faster lens like an f2 or f1.8, f1.4 would be ideal. But f2.8 is still, uh, it still lets in plenty of light even for untracked astrophotography. And bear in mind that the wider the lens goes, the longer you can expose for given the rule of 500 or some other rules, uh, to, to, to not have any apparent star trace. So with a 16 millimeter focal length, I keep looking down at the lens, it gives you around 30 seconds of exposure according to the rule of 500. So I think this is plenty at f2.8 to get decent images on a standard tripod without a tracker. When it comes to focusing, like I mentioned, you need to go to the menu to enable manual focusing. But once you do that, the focusing experience is very much uh, pleasant. And there is plenty of room past infinity in order to really dial in the focus on your stars. So no complaints about that. But now let's take a look at what you all have been probably waiting for, which is the image quality, especially in the corners at different apertures. So let's take a look at that now. 
So right here I have a shot of, um, there's Milky Way somewhere here in the middle, maybe not very apparent on this photo, but as you can see this is shot at f2.8, um, this is shot at f4, if we just compare vignetting, again these are raw images, here I have some JPEGs um, converted by the camera, but let's take a look at RAWs. So at f2.8 very strong vignetting, at f4 less vignetting, at f5.6 even less vignetting, at f8 again we have um, a little bit of an improvement uh, here when it comes to vignetting. Um, and now let's take a look at the image quality in the corners. So right here in this corner we have uh, Pleiades, so let's zoom into uh, 200%. And as you can see, the astigmatism and the coma is, is pretty strong at f2.8. I wouldn't say it is the worst, I definitely have seen worse, but it, it is very much apparent, especially if you have some bright stars. For instance, somewhere here on the bottom, I don't know, is this may be Vega even or something, a very bright star near the corner is going to show up uh, as very, very strong astigmatism. So let's go back to Pleiades and let's compare between f2.8 and f4. If we go to the comparison, as you can see at f4 the astigmatism is definitely better, but still it is very much apparent. And then if we compare between f4 and f5.6, again let's look at the Pleiades. Uh, at f5.6 we still uh, see uh, an improvement with regards to f4 when it comes to astigmatism. I would say that this is very much acceptable. Uh, especially if you if you look at it, you know, in full scale and not pixel peep at 200 zoom, you're not going to notice it. But I would have to shoot it at f5.6. I would definitely need some kind of tracking. And I actually shot these using my new Skywatcher EQM35 equatorial mount, which I am very happy about. And I will be making a video about it soon, but that's a topic for another day. And then finally, let's take a look at a uh, comparison between f5.6 and f8. So let's look at Pleiades again. And then you have a pretty much the same. So I would say at f5.6, the aberrations are go away as much as they can. And stopping down further than f5.6 doesn't give any apparent improvement. Again, you can download these images and inspect them for yourself. When it comes to image quality and star quality in the middle, let's take out the f2.8 again. I think this is this is this is really good. I don't see any complaints here, and I actually used uh, this lens uh, in conjunction with my astronomic uh, hydrogen alpha filter to get uh, this shot of of some parts of the Milky Way. This is shot at f4, and I cropped out a little bit of those ugly edges with astigmatism, and then you you, you can probably recognize some of the uh, some of the well-known nebula in this region of the Milky Way. So if you are willing to crop out the edges, and like I mentioned. Uh, when, I, when I started talking about astrophotography with regards to the RF-16 f2.8, the 16mm is probably a little bit too wide for, for standalone shots, so if you have enough megapixels, if you have a Canon R5 for instance, and you can crop in a little bit, you can you can basically discard those ugly edges with vignetting and with, with distortion, with um, astigmatism and coma, and still come up with very decent images, so overall, especially for the price and for the form factor, I would, I think I would recommend it for us photography, yeah. But you need to, you need to know its weaknesses in order to work around them somehow. And the third use of this lens, which, which Canon mentioned on their launch, and I think this is the aspect of this lens that it really shines with, is vlogging. So when it comes to vlogging, I think this may be just the best lens out there if you're on a Canon EOS R system. Uh, cameras. The 16mm focal length on a full frame camera gives a very nice field of view for comfortably holding your camera in front of you and I don't need to extend my hand really really far like I would have if I was shooting this on my 24mm Sigma. I can instead just hold it comfortably like this. I don't need a Gorilla Pod, I don't need anything like this and I can do this comfortably for longer periods of time. And also this lens is super tiny and super lightweight, so again my hand will not get tired from holding my camera like this. And this lens also has a pretty crazy close focusing distance, so I can really punch in on my face if I wanted to for a dramatic effect. Or I can just hold it like this. And also the autofocusing motor on this camera is crazy silent, you know, sometimes I even wonder if the camera is doing any focusing at all because I can do this all day 
and I cannot hear anything, absolutely anything from the autofocusing motor, but the lens of course is autofocusing and is also very, very responsive in my opinion. Also the f2.8 maximum aperture I think is definitely enough to have nice out of focus backgrounds for your videos and I don't feel like you would need anything brighter than f2.8 for these kind of videos. So for vlogging, I would absolutely 100% recommend this lens. The autofocus of this lens, the, the, the lack of noise on the, on the autofocus and the responsiveness actually really, really surprised me. Probably it was the, the, the biggest surprise about this lens that I had. And you can check out this clip when I just move around an item to force the autofocusing motor to focus on this lens and listen what kind of sound it, it produces from a built-in microphone and camera. So as you can see, it is pr pretty much absolutely silent. So when you are uh, shooting a video using autofocus, whether you are filming yourself or filming other people, then I think you will definitely be happy with this lens. There is a bit of focus breathing, is this is something that you are concerned about. But other than that, I think for video work and for vlogging, this lens is really, really awesome. The one thing that it lacks maybe for that is image stabilization. But again, if you're using one of the newer RF series lens, RS series cameras like the R6 or the R5, you're going to have in-body image stabilization. And besides with a 16 mil, you don't really need that much of a stabilization anyway. So to conclude, I think I would definitely recommend this lens. This is so cheap. It costs like 300 US dollars, which is really a joke. A lens that cheap, that small, you can keep it in your, in your pocket even if you wanted to or something. You can slip it into your bag. You will definitely find a room for that. It is perfect for like traveling, hiking, walking around, you know, the city with your camera dangling on your, on your neck. You're not going to get tired of vlogging and having your, your hand extended like this. For this kind of use cases, this lens is really awesome. So yes, I am going to be keeping this lens for myself. I'm going to be using it for vlogging. I'm going to be using it for some kinds of astrophotography, maybe mostly time lapses, like I mentioned, but you can definitely also end up with great images of the Milky Way if you crop in a little bit, like I, like I mentioned previously. So if you want to get this lens for yourself, you can find the links down below in the description. And um, if you like this video, definitely give it a like. I would really appreciate that as always. And also consider subscribing to my channel. I will be posting more videos about photography, astrophotography, more reviews of products are coming in the future for sure. So consider subscribing, consider also checking out the content I already have on my channel and hopefully see you next time. Bye bye.